Oh! Oh my god. It's been a while since I played this song. Okay. What's up, everyone, and welcome to FAQ 163. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys in on a little, 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 little secret of mine. This guitar that I'm sitting with here is it's an SB 1.6. Look at that. It's uh, freaking amaze balls uh, of a finish on this guitar right here. But I have a little secret. This was the sample before the production model, and you know, it has a nice wood binding right here. But look at this. It doesn't have a binding on the headstock. It's supposed to have a binding on the headstock. Mistakes happen, okay? The uh, version that's getting sold has a binding on the headstock. <gasps> okay, but this one does not, which makes this sample rare. Like anyone would care, but you know, I care. I think it's cool. Shit like that, you know, small little things that make uh, guitars uh, different and uh, a little custom, maybe. <laughs> Oh shit, we're doing an FAQ right now. Let me answer some of you guys' questions. Pete is asking, Fuck, do you always set the input gain to zero on audio interfaces when recording guitar? Usually people tend to set it to the edge, so it doesn't clip with heavy palm mutes, including me. Been trying to send the gain to zero and it feels better at least when playing, but when recording, the single waveform seems a little weak on the DAW. Disco partner. Just saying. That's an excellent question. Back in the day, people would use, uh, you know, DI boxes to record guitar or like uh, DI tracks of your guitar. In today's audio interfaces, a lot of them already has an instrument input to them, uh, where you basically just connect the guitar straight into the audio interface without a DI box. And I've been doing this for quite some time, maybe for more than 10 years, using different uh, audio interfaces. Uh, I'm kind of stuck with Apogee and UAD. And they have insane instrument inputs. They're called high Z, I think. Whenever I record DI signals, I always keep the input gain at zero for this. Why, you might ask? Well, it's because it's the absolute cleanest way of me capturing the DI, in my opinion. I try to experiment a little bit with, uh, you know, boosting or a little bit of that just before it clips, but no, still sounds the cleanest when I have the input at zero. And it's also just a good default mode because then I know like, okay, I just make sure the gain is at zero at all times. Then I know for a fact that, oh, it will be the same DI signal and DI strength as on all the other recordings that I've done for the past 10 years, depending on what audio interface I'm using, obviously. So yeah, I usually do zero input because it's easy to remember and it definitely sounds the cleanest. And uh, it's not only when you record a DI and you hear the DI by itself that it's clean, it's also when you reamp the DI that it sounds the cleanest when you have the input uh, gain on zero. But then obviously when you reamp and bring out the signal to an amplifier, then, then you can set the gain to whatever, basically, as long as it's not clipping and all that. It's just when you record a DI, I like to keep it clean. Okay? Good question. Sugar Mommy Official. Fuck! Have you ever cut your hair short? Uh, yes. I've had long hair probably three or four times, something like that. I think the first time I cut it, I was probably a teenager still in, uh, in school, in 90s. Just as I cut my hair, I immediately regretted it. And uh, yeah, that's just how it is. So immediately after cutting my hair, you know, from really long to short, I uh, started saving up my hair again. And then somewhere in uh, 2004, maybe, when my hair was long ag again, I'm like, okay, it would be nice to have short hair again. Which, you know, it's really nice to have short hair. It's just less uh, maintenance. But uh, I cut my hair, immediately regretted it. And uh, <laughs> then I did it again. Uh, when was this? Uh, late 2000 something? Uh, Oh, or did I? Maybe I only have uh, long hair three times. I mean, I've had long hair now for at least 15 years, I think. Uh, I've been cutting it a little bit shorter here and there just to, you know, keep it keep in good health. Let's just say that. And I've been thinking about cutting my hair again at some point. Just not right now while I'm still touring with a band and, uh, you know, I, I'm doing this. But I definitely wouldn't mind going back to having short hair again. I know that the internet community would probably go absolutely batshit insane if I did. So let's just hold off a little bit, okay? Thank you. Theo Anugra. Fuck, hi Ola, do you have some sort of baldness? 
I think I might not get bald immediately. Uh, if you look at my family tree and I'm looking at my like my grandparents because usually it skips a generation or something like that but all of them had hair, you know, on top of their head for a very long time so I think I'm spared when it comes to baldness obviously, you know, you're getting a little bit of this a little bit of this, it's just creeping up here when it starts to look stupid, I'm gonna cut it, okay? that's my plan Jose Gabriel de Vint Fuck! More of a statement than a question, but you do know that after doing such a great job with the best metal album of each year of the 90s we're going to ask you to do the same with both the 80s and 2000s Right! Yes! Uh, huge success... No, well, not a huge success, but mildly... Hu mildly small success when I made my FAQ talking about my favorite 90s metal album I couldn't put in a band two times during a decade you know, that was, the, that was the rule right there so I've done another list for the 21st century which ranges from the year of 2000 until 2009 and the year of 2000 I was turning 19 years old that's when Dead Heart in a Dead World by Nevermore was released done deal f***ing hell my life was changed forever and ever Andy Sneap was the mixer producer and this album has one of my favorite guitar tones of all time Jeff Loomis sounds absolutely monstrous with his uh, seventh string uh, I, I made a video of this uh, talking about this album and how Jeff was using a really thick uh, lowest string uh, to get that, that distinct f***ing low end on that string man and uh, oh my god this album is perfect I can... I, I never grow tired of listening to this album it's just so amazing and Warl Dane is one of a kind obviously no one can replicate his type of voice and... Uh, oh, fuck man, I love this album just saying 2001, another banger of an album Opeth Blackwater Park what? holy fuck I think probably one of the best Swedish metal albums of all time what a fucking milestone of an album that is unbelievably unbelievably believably captivating to listen to that album it's oh my god all the emotions all the just the mood swing it's just so typically swedish that despair of the swedes right there it's just so hopeless like life is so hopeless when you listen to this album it's so beautiful and so dark at the same time and it's yeah holy shit face man it's so good 2002 split decision during this time if you compare this to the 90s where I was listening to a lot of like groove metal and death metal and stuff like that in the beginning of the 2000s I listened a lot more and more to progressive metal and venturing into that kind of realm right there also more brutal death metal I must say 2002 Pain of Salvation another epic Swedish band Remedy Lane is the album and Daniel Gildenlöv or Glidenmedel as we call it in Swedish one of the best vocalists out there in the prog metal world in my opinion and this album is so good they have a lot of other really good albums but this is a softer side of them and it's absolutely incredible a lot of really good songs on this album but also on 2002 I have to mention Vandenplas which is also another progressive metal band and their album Beyond Daylight I saw Van Den Plas play and open up for Dream Theater back in 1998 I think really really awesome prog metal band a little more hit-esque as in writing more catchy choruses and whatnot it's a great f***ing band so 2002 Pain of Salvation, Remedy Lane and honorable mention Van Den Plas Beyond Daylight okay in 2003 I really had a hard time picking one album for this year because there weren't really that many favorites this year for me but I keep one at number one which is Master Plan and Master Plan was a collaboration between a lot of really talented musicians uh, people from Halloween and stuff like that and it's an incredible album second place Dream Theater Train of Thought now I think Train of Thought is an excellent album but I also thought that it was Dream Theater becoming something else I think they already was were starting to become something else with six degrees of inner turbulence but uh, they definitely shifted to a bigger production kind of thing with train of thought even though i love the album and i really like the songs it's it sounds different it's a different sounding dream fitter okay 2003 also 
two bands. Uh, Rammstein, Reise, Reise. Wow. The production on this album for the time was just amazing. And uh, me and Luis went to that show in Stockholm. Holy shit, man. One of the most insane live shows I've ever been to when it comes to production value and just, you know, pyros and effects and whatnot. It was amazeballs. And another album for 2002 that was also very important, Exodus, Tempo of the Damned, Andy Sneap, sounds fucking incredible. And uh, guitar tone, man. Just love that guitar tone in that one. Holy shit. Okay, I need to speed things up. 2005. Another Andy Sneap album? Oh, shit. Arch Enemy, Doomsday Machine. Fucking incredible sounding album right there. Still tops one of my favorite sounding albums, the metal albums, uh, for a long time. It's just so fucking good. No question about it. Doomsday Machine, Arch Enemy. Okay? Did I have a second option? No. Like, that was the option for 2005. No question, okay? And worth mentioning is that these are my picks for the best albums. If you have your own pick, put them in the comment section of this video. Let me know. What was your year favorite album? 2006. Tool. Huh? 10,000 days. Wait. How long had it been be before they released uh, Lateralis? Lateralis? That was the previous album. Uh, very many years. Many years. And uh, I think 10,000 Days, while a lot of people thought it was very a lot more of a mainstream tool, I thought it was excellent. It has a lot of great songs on it. It's also one of those albums that you can listen front to back. You know, you won't get tired of it. So, 2006, 10,000 Days. In 2007, Machine Head released The Blackening. The Blackening was a welcomed album and, in my opinion, a return to form after, you know, Machine Head venturing into like a little bit of new metal and stuff like that. The Blackening is... Uh, it, it was just really good. It sounded like old Machine Head, you know, songs were long and intricate and it... Banger. Banger of an album. But also in 2007, this is not a metal album though, so this is a complete curveball, but Radiohead in Rainbows. Oh my god. If you're not a fan of Radiohead, I feel sorry for you. It, great album. They also released it for free. Which back in 2007 was f***ing incredible. You went to their website and you downloaded it for free or just, uh, you know, donated money, uh, you donated money, basically. Or you can get it for free. Amazing. 2008. Gojira. Gojira. The way of all flesh. Holy shit. I mean, listen to that album, man. You... Enough said. Incredible production on this album that still holds up as sounding incredibly modern today. I mean, how many years? 13 years ago? Which is not that long ago, but I think this production on this album is the best in Gojira's catalog, in my opinion. It's so sick. All right, last but not least, 2009. What could it be? Alice in Chains, baby. Black gives away to blue. Such a strong album right there. Even with the catalog of Alice in Chains, I think this might actually be my favorite Alice in Chains album when it comes to the songwriting aspect. It's just so good. There's so many good songs on this album. Really dark, really... Uh, feels really desperate and... Uh, just gotta love that stuff, man. And uh, yeah, what are your favorite albums of the 21st century? F man, the V on this is absolutely horrendous. <laughs> I have to do something about it. Okay, shit. Where's my dog, by the way? I was just thinking about my dog. Where, where have you been? Have you been sleeping? Oh, doo -doo 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 -doo. There's a little airplane coming. Hey, Poday. Oh. I know the feeling. Oh, this is it. This is such a chain. Oh. So there you go. Those are my albums. Let me know about yours in the comment section. Okay? Great question. Sebastian Lera, Sai Seattle. Fuck, hey Ola, not counting solo guitars. If you had to pick one guitar for the rest of your life, which one would it be and why? Cheers, man. Um, shit. I think I received this question before a couple of times, but maybe I'm changing, maybe I changed my perspective and, you know, maybe that's okay if I change, you know, change my uh, choice every other year because, you know, man, I change, I mature, maybe I want something different and, you know, I don't know man. Maybe the Strat? My custom shop Strat? Maybe my JP. Like my Ibanez JPM guitar. If I would have been prepared, I would bring out these guitars here today. But let me just do this. Just because I don't have it here, but I have something here. What do I have here? The only guitar that's not a Solar in here is this. 
Okay, let's say that it's this one. It's the Ernie Ball uh, drum tushi. Lilla lilla no stem. I'm gonna sit in this direction, you can see over there, because it's cooler. Oh! What are you doing? Oh shit, she's stretching my microphone cable. That's not okay. You know, I can I can definitely see myself using this for the rest of my life. No problem. That is if I can't pick any solo guitar. That's just remember that, okay? That was a it's a trick question. This is gonna be a problem. She, she's uh, she's all over my cape. Mate, what you do? Hutta, hutta, hutta. Sorry, I have to kick <laughs> kick you away. Sorry, you're you're ruining you're ruining my FAQ. No, you're only making my FAQ like ten times better. A lot more people are gonna watch my FAQ now when there's a dog in it. Just saying, you're the cutest little dog. Uh, thank you. That was a great question. Matthew Swanepoel. Fuck. Hey, Ola. When recording your latest album, did you use an amp or an amp sin? Also, what amp or amp sin did you use and why? Okay. Uh, for a great question. For Star Singer, my latest album, uh, for rhythm guitars, I was using the Mesa Boogie Bad Lander. And at the time, it was probably my favorite sounding Mesa Boogie. And I was really into it. So I ended up using it on the album for the rhythm guitars, using an Ibanez Tube Screamer in the front. And for solos and stuff like that, I was using the, the Neural DSP Pliny. Uh, for solos, I don't necessarily feel that I need to reamp solos through an amplifier. Rhythm tone is a little bit more, you know, that, that's more of my baby, you know? So I like to reamp that with real amplifier. And you know, it, in my opinion, it still sounds a way better when you reamp than when you're using a plugin. Uh, it just makes it sound a little bit more real. Let's just say that. So uh, for the uh, rhythm guitars, Mesa Boogie Band Leonard, I put I put a picture here, and for the solos and leads and cleans, Neural DSP Pliny, basically. B hey, Ola, I've just started playing guitar, and I'd like to know if my focus should be on playing more notes per second or on making more YouTube dollars per second. Also, Ingvi the Swede does not like donuts. Do you like donuts? I do like donuts. Not so serious question, but I'm gonna answer it anyways. Uh, playing more notes per second? I mean, if you want to, why not? Making more YouTube dollars per second? If you want to, why not? Just don't expect to make too much money out of YouTube just yet. I think back in 2011, when I got my YouTube partnership, I saw a post on this on Facebook. Uh, I think I made like two bucks a month or something like that. It was great. <laughs> It was great. Francisco Portodondo. Hi, Ola. Now that you got your own new tattoo sleeve, how do you feel about your old tattoos? Thank you. Yes, with my new sleeve right here, obviously looking absolutely kick ass. This one is kind of. Uh, I, I, I feel that this, this arm right here is more like a hobo tattoo arm, you know, where it's like a, a little bit tattoo here, a little bit here. A little, so it's more like a. Uh, I, I don't know. It's just not as planned. But I, I think I'm gonna let uh, the guy who made this sleeve, he's gonna look over this arm and maybe, you know, make it better. How about that? He's gonna renovate my arm, basically. Michael Elgland, question for next fact. How much is the rent for your office? You know, in Sweden we don't talk about money, okay? And it's almost a little bit rude to ask about money. So I'm not gonna answer this question. Let me just say, it's expensive. But. It's definitely worth it, because with the office, you know, this is my workspace right here. So it's a lot easier for me to divide what's being work and what's being personal life and private life. And for that alone, the office is so much worth it. And uh, I'm very, very happy with the decision of getting this office. Louise can't say that I'm, you know, hogging the living room with uh, big 4x12s and whatnot. She can't really say anything. Here, I just, you know, I just put all my 4x12s here, man. And it's fine, because it's my office that I'm renting. Good. Denzel, yes. Do you have any favorite guitarists if you can't say Dimebag Daryl? I probably have to go with Jeff Loomis, man, or John Petrucci. Those are, those are basically my three uh, biggest influences. Uh, Dimebag, John Petrucci, and Jeff Loomis right there. Per Nelson, maybe? He's an incredible guitar player, and uh, you know I like the the Lydian way of his playing because he loves to play Lydian, and uh, I just love that that sound that he does. But Jeff Loomis, man, holy f face in my mouth, that's just 
another level. He's just amazing. And obviously, I'm very proud that he's on my album, Starsinger.com. No, it's not Starsinger.com. It's oldenglandshop.com. You can buy it from there. I'll put a link here, here, and you can uh, purchase it and uh, get it. How about that? Anyways, guys, that was the absolute last question of this FAQ. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, put them in the comment section of this video, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Two thousand and one. <laughs> Two thousand and one.